Hello there, my name is Oscar Clark and I'm here to continue my ongoing quest to understand everything you wanted to know about game dev but never dared to ask. This is part of the Game Dev London podcast, which is a community of amazing people who just love talking about and sharing their love of the details behind making games. So I'm uh, lucky enough to be uh, joined by uh, the amazing Rami Ishmael, Games Industry Ambassador, who not only is known for amazing games, but is worked in supporting other game devs, and uh, also for developing the press kit used by almost everybody I know. One of my favourite things that you do, though, is, is actually um, to call out what isn't Arabic on uh, uh, various TV <laughs> shows and games. That yeah. I really love. So, Rami, tell, I've, I've talked too long. Tell me a little bit about more, more about yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm a game developer. Uh, I, I make video games. I've been doing that since I was uh, six years old. Um, been doing it professionally since uh, about 12, 13 years now. Accidentally started a game studio called Vlambeer. We were best known for games such as uh, Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Luftrousers, Nuclear Throne. Then took um, shut down that studio back in 2020, happily. And uh, then decided to take a... Um, a sabbatical year which i failed at miserably so i have like <laughs> six projects or something going on right now um and yeah besides that as you, as you sort of uh, refer to i've spent the last decade sort of traveling the world and learning from game developers everywhere meeting game developers everywhere going to events giving talks um and sort of taking the learnings from some places to other places talking to people and and creating opportunity. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think that's where we met as well. It's yeah, just sort of on, exactly. this, on this events. We, we spent, this has been the weirdest thing about the last 18 months is that I'm not in some different country <laughs> and bumping into you randomly. Like, um, right. It's really odd favorite... to not see you for that long. I will <laughs> be very honest because we, we went to a lot of overlapping events. A lot like, of uh, it. One of my favorite ones was uh, we, uh, I, w I was invited to uh, Porto Alegre in uh, Brazil and Brazil. Uh, I had no idea, and there you are. You turn up, and we're in this this university. She's like a two hour coach drive. Right, away. it wasn't even in Porto Alegre. No, it was like, exactly. It was pretty far out of the city. Yeah. Yeah, we were driving for two hours there, two hours right. back the same day. Right. And yeah, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. But, but no, but I mean, was... yeah. I think I think those are some of my favorite trips, right? Because mm -hmm. you get to meet these developers doing game development work and out out of passion and the level of passion they have to bring to be making games in a place where there aren't as many meetups there is no press interest games aren't being covered they're not being spoken There's about no they infrastructure don't have... of industry that they can tap right. into yeah and and they're making games regardless like i've mm. seen incredible developers everywhere make games about you know sometimes trying to fit into what the western market is doing or what the japanese market is doing Sometimes doing the opposite, right? Making yes. things that are genuine to them, sincere to them. That, and I think that there is such. Um, it's really easy to want to fight for them, and I think over the past ten years, that's sort of what happened to me. Is I, I sort of transitioned from just wanting to make games to wanting to help other people make games, and wanting to make rent to help it, wanting to make other people make rent because you can't help but. M if you meet developers around the world and you meet them in Montevideo, Uruguay, you meet them in Indonesia and Jakarta, you meet them in um, in Madagascar, you meet them you meet them around the world, you just realize how much potential is un is just it's untouched. untouched yeah. Untouched. It's it, well I think we both do a lot of mentoring type stuff as well. Mm -hmm. I think uh, currently we're, we're I think we're both mentors on the Indonesian. Um, is it the Indonesian one? We're, yeah, right. um, I got two or three of them all at the moment. I, I knew yeah, at least one of them. <laughs> yes. And just like there, I mean, I happen to know one of the teams already because I'd uh, done some. In fact, they'd actually backed my Rocky Horror game. Would you believe? Uh, with a lot, all that long ago, uh, well, no. one of the guys there had, and in right. return, I gave them a day of consultancy, and they were lovely about it. They happened to be on this accelerator, but it's so fascinating that just, I mean, again, just talking to them, seeing how they're trying to adapt, how they're trying to learn, how they're trying to work out how can they take their games and bring them to the West. Right. But also, I think what what I'm getting, what I get so much value out of it because I kind of get a different way of thinking about game development. I get a different way of thinking about what are the barriers for those people what are the things that are going on in their market i don't know but i find it, it i it's so enriching uh, just per professionally let alone personally right uh, and also you know 
I, the assumption that we know it all is too easy. Oh yeah, we we absolutely do not like, and I think that that is one of the most humbling things about this, mm -hmm. and and one of the things that I think has really helped shape me into the person I am today. And I I will admit that, you know, there's always room for improvement, but I'm very thankful that I turned into who I am today because I think I I try to do good where I can, but the 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 thing that really the thing that really teaches you is just how much we don't know, right? About how games can get made, how in certain situations games have to be made, how much passion and work goes into making a thing when there's no context around you. Because, you know, there was no indie scene in the Netherlands when I started doing uh, doing Blambeer. And uh, me and my co-founder set up the indie meetup in Utrecht, specifically my co-founder set up the, the indie meetup in Utrecht. Um, I was setting up, you know, other like initiatives and, and collectives and, and sort of that indie scene sort of like built up over time. But we had guerrilla games, we had some yeah. government support, we had Ronimo games, we had a bunch of studios out there in the Netherlands that were already proving that you could do game development in the Netherlands. Like it was not a job that would be frowned upon per se. Like it wasn't as respectable as being a doctor or a lawyer, but it was a, it was a thing you could do. One, a lot of countries I visit, the biggest challenge isn't like, can we make video games? It's how do we convince my parents that this is a real job <laughs> and not a waste of, of life? It's almost like you're going back to my era when this wasn't even a thing. And, and uh, I didn't even know John Hare was set up in my hometown right. doing sensible soccer. You know, it's like, right. and I, it, you know, now I know him quite well. It's like yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I, when I first pitched, I was 18 and... Um, we were talk we were talking about pitching on things like um you know Commodore sixty fours and stuff like that. Right. I mean, it was like ridiculous a long time ago. Right. Um but yeah, it, they're kind of there with the added disadvantage that there is a very successful big games industry out there mm. that is competing with them. Yes. Despite them not having the same resources, right? Yeah. It's kind of like being an indie nowadays. Like back in the days when we were early indies in, in 2010, 2008, sort of two thousand eight, two thousand and ten region. Uh, when it was sort of like the first version of this current generation of independent developers uh, coming up, we didn't have to compete with a Vlambeer. There was no Vlambeer. There, there was no competition. You made a good game and it got attention. And even though nobody cared, like that was enough to, to keep making games. And now every game that comes out has to compete with Undertale, with Minecraft, with Fortnite, with Vlambeer, yeah. with Mike Bithel, with a Capybara, <laughs> with whoever, right? Yeah. Like you just the 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 barrier to entry has lowered but the barrier to success has, has gone become up. has gone so far up yeah it's that... a, it's an interesting threshold isn't it because there are different levels of success uh, right. and there are different audiences and we have the scope to do it so i mean one of the things that i think is really interesting is that what we i think we're talking about is an understanding of the business of games i mean so making a game is one thing making a business of a game so going from a hobby to a profession is a different thing right and one thing i know that you're very good at and i've seen you do this many a time is to talk people through in a strategic in a kind of business consultancy style how to think about making games and so you know tell, tell us a little bit more about that right i think i think the thing i realized is that that's the, the business of games is something that we all kind of assume is is a thing that an understanding or a knowledge that you can gather just out there somewhere mm -hmm. but the reality is that a lot of that discussion is behind closed doors it's in mm -hmm. hallways at large events it's uh talking in a bar or at a um, an ice cream store or whatever it is well i was going to say the ice cream store this is so we, where um i think we had our first proper conversation when it wasn't on a stage was actually you invite me out to yeah, ice right. cream. Uh, yes, uh, it, it, after uh, a pocket game event or something. It was the the, the morning. The the Hag yeah, it was <laughs> it was the Hagen dust store on Leicester Square. Yes. That yes. doesn't oh. does that still exist? I don't think. No, I don't exists. think so. I think oh. it's gone. Oh, then again, there's... I wouldn't know. I've no, even though like twenty miles away, thirty miles away, I haven't <laughs> been in London for, right. for a year and a half. They just it's had such good ice cream fondue. I had to go yeah. there. It was yeah, no exactly. way around it. But um, yeah, no the. A lot of this, a lot of this business and understanding of business comes from the process of going through it multiple times and then realizing what does, what doesn't work. And I think one of the things that was really helpful for me is 
I think I have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, like uh, from my from my family side. Like I'm an, I'm the child of an immigrant and and um, somebody who was always really supportive of me doing who wh whatever I wanted, right? Yeah. Um, and that combination makes that I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a troublemaker, I guess. I like to I like to go where things are either broken or new, and I try to fix them, right? That's yeah. how things like Prescott happened. That's how. Uh, I ended up being one of the first indies in this first wave or second wave, really, of independent games on console, how we ended up doing a premium game on iOS when freemium was all the hype, how we ended up being the first game ever sold on Twitch, after which Twitch launched a storefront. Like, yeah. I've been in a lot of strange situations, and you you gather a lot of stories talking to developers, you gather a lot of, of information, and, and you kind of create this understanding of the business of games. But that information is completely and utterly opaque. Yeah, exactly. Unless you are part of that system. So for people mm -hmm. making games out there that don't have access to that information, there's just no good way of learning besides trying to make a deal and then pitching the wrong way and realizing your game isn't getting funded and losing six months of your life, right? And I thought that was a little unfair. So That sounds like my career. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it's a lot of people's career. But yeah. the... The trick of it is that you get to learn every time, right? And most other people don't get to learn because they don't have the context or the framework or the structure or the network or the connections to actually learn from it. So yeah. I realize that the way you talk about this, the way you, you explain this is not by just giving people the bland theory because the theory is ever changing, right? Okay. You have to, you have to find a way to explain the way of thinking about it, sort mm. of a structural way of thinking. And I think the best way I've found is to tell stories, the stories of how certain decisions got made, stories of how I've messed up, right? The stories of how I failed, the stories of how I've succeeded, and sort of placing them in a context and, and sort of showing why a certain decision worked out a certain way. Not as a replicate this, because I feel theory can very often be um, dogmatic. Right when you hear a theory and you go like, "Okay, this is how it works," it's really hard to think. Okay, if I make an adjustment, it would still work. Well, the reality of business is a lot of it is intuition, a lot of it is feeling, a lot of it is people, a lot of it is soft skills. Right, like a lot there's of it's process as well. I mean, structural process, process can be yep. really important. Thinking about how other people think about things is mm. really important in business. Right, like what opportunities, what risks, what uh, chances, what where does risk shift when a game's get when a game gets funded by a publisher, right? Yeah. And how much can you expect in exchange for that risk? That's a yeah. question that uh, a lot of people that are very good in the business of, of of the games industry they have they've gathered a feeling for okay if we do this then risk shifts there and if risk shifts there it should be reimbursed this way, right? Yeah. That's not a thing you can just say, like, okay, well, if risks go, if the risk goes 10% towards the publisher, you deserve like this percent of budget extra, or, or you can't do that because that will no. no longer be true, like three months from I know now. it's all dynamic and it's all relationship. -based. Depends so, on I'm... your standing, depends on yeah. your history, depends on their standing, their history, what you're adding to their portfolio or to their business, whether the game has traction. And you get this feeling, but you can't explain this feeling. Like, how do you so... communicate this feeling? With all this, it's like almost why on earth would we make games? It sounds like right. a terribly <laughs> difficult thing to do. So let, let's switch tone a little bit. So let's get to the sort of heart of what I want to get to today. So one of the things I think is really important that we don't often um, dive into, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's one of the sort of most important questions for me. Is it, well, there's two questions really. One is who is the audience? And um, right. uh, my last podcast, I, I went through with Anna and talked about about that in a bit more detail. But for this one, I want to talk about the, the other one, which I think is almost the ultimate question, is why are we making a game? <laughs> 